Okay. Hello? YouTube, what are you doing? <sighs> All right, are we good? Uh, yeah, something something was happening with that one. I don't know. Oh, I'm so friggin' Grr, YouTube. Let's see what it says now. Yeah, it did confirm there was some kind of issue with the stream, which is why it dropped out, but uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. Just, I guess, deal with it when it happens. <sighs> we pay f so much more extra money for good internet, and it's never good. I swear to God, it's a trap. Okay, yeah, it says we got a, be a good connection this time. I don't know why the last one was bad. But anyway, we'll start over. We didn't get that far. We are reading Demon City Shinjuku today. Uh, a story by Hideyuki Kikuchi, a master of horror, uh, who was very influential, is very, he's still alive, very influential to uh, Japanese horror, Japanese anime. Um, it's big in the States. We got most of his works translated, but not all. And we're going to read his first bur book, Burke, his first Burke, uh, Demon City Shinjuku from 1980-something. Uh, it is very dark. It is very uh, nasty at times. I will try to warn for the worst things, but horrible, terrible, nasty, sexy things will happen. I won't read the sexy things. <laughs> anyway. Prologue. The hour grew nigh. It was the 13th of September, a night early in the opening decade of the 21st century. In the police box near the entrance to Shinjuku Station, a young officer finished his paperwork, got up from his desk, and stretched mightily. A great feeling of relief flooded his body. The cop was clad in a reinforced ballistic helmet and thick Kevlar vest. One way or another, he'd made it through another day. His eyes were drawn to the digital clock on the desk. 2.59 in the morning. The shopping district in front of the station was wrapped in darkness. The stores had shuttered their doors and rolled up the sidewalks. The foot traffic was sparse. Taxis were few and far between. This time of night... The only hustle and bustle was in the direction of Kabukicho. Even so, there was no letting down his guard. In this town, anything cop-related was bound to end up in somebody's crosshairs, no matter what time of day. A terrorist or just a bunch of juvenile delinquents looking for a thrill could come calling with a black market Tokarev semi-auto or handmade grenades. His mind flashed back to the night's logbook. 29 injuries or accidents, 34 muggings, 23 robbery assaults, 80 cases of larceny, and 17 homicides. These last three or four years had turned the new millennium into a real doozy. Comparably speaking, though, it had been a relatively quiet day. He went outside to get a breath of fresh air. The cool night was an early harbinger of fall. The stars twinkled in an unusually clear sky. A thought came to him out of the blue. What was this time of night called again? The clock silently flipped over to three o'clock. The cop was overcome by a strange feeling of disquiet. Studio Alta and Mitsui Sumimoto Bank jutted out from the blackness before him, steadily reaching into the sky. No. The buildings weren't rising up. He was sinking down into the earth. That was when his previous question came back to him. The witching hour. The time when the devil held sway and humans and monsters crossed paths. The police officer wasn't exactly right about the time, but he was nevertheless correct. This moment was a meeting between man and magic. After the swaying came the roar. The eight stories above the My City subway station mall leaned way over. Unable to absorb the violent shaking and pitching, the pillars and steel beams bent and broke. The tearing of pipes and rebar drowned out the screaming alarms. The bedrock-like concrete subfloors pancaked. The display windows and showcases piled high with garish goods crashed down like an avalanche. An earthquake like none before struck without the slightest warning. The nightclubbers wandering down Shinjuku Avenue didn't have a chance. No sooner did they feel the ground shaking beneath their feet than they were thrown dozens of feet into the air. 
and then hurling to the ground like trampoline artists missing their marks before they knew what had happened. The streets filled with screams, rolling on the ground as if bucked from the backs of wild stallions. The young men and women watched as Takano, Mitsukoshi, Isetan, the very edifices that symbolized their vibrant and beautiful lives, came crashing to the ground. No earthquake-resistant construction existed that could resist such plutonian forces. Razor-sharp shards of window glass rained down as if taking aim at their bodies. Thousand-ton blocks of concrete delivered the merciful coup de grace. This late at night, in this commercial district, around the station, the human carnage was relatively light. The clubs and bars in Kabukicho, the town that never slept, were packed. The military personnel at the Ministry of Defense barracks in Ichigaya were coming off a hard day of training and slumbering peacefully. The student housing in Takata no Baba and Waseda, the quiet residential neighborhoods of Ochiai and Yarai Cho, most were swallowed up by the earth. Before becoming the slightest bit aware of their impending fate, they were crushed by great volumes of weight into another geological sedimentary layer. The earthquake lasted all of three seconds. Just as there were no preliminary tremors, there were no aftershocks. Shinjuku was destroyed in a single shrug of the Earth's crust. But it would still take a long time until it drew its last breath. Flames from the stoves in the all-night restaurants and taverns ignited the gas pouring from ruptured lines. Petrol flooded from gas stations onto the streets and added another conflagration to the blood and cries. Every way out was blocked by high-tension wires sparking like fireworks and the smoldering remains of houses and shops. The poisonous flowers of flame sprang open as if after a spring rain. The sooty black smoke wrapped itself like a blanket around the barely living as the screams and shouts went on, it seemed, forever. A magnitude 8.5 earthquake had struck directly beneath the city center. The epicenter was pinpointed at 5,000 meters under Shinjuku Station. At least that's what was recorded in the files at the Japan Meteorological Agency, along with a stamp that simply said, Estimated. But even though Shinjuku was leveled, its adjoining metropolitan neighbors, Shibuya, Minato, Chiyoda, suffered no damage whatsoever. That night, the seismograph in the basement of the Imperial Palace barely budged. This strange phenomenon came to be known in later years as the Devil Quake. It remained a puzzle to geologists and seismologists the world over. In time, the Great Shinjuku Earthquake was simply one more item added to an already long list of unexplained phenomena. Shit gets real real quick, don't it? Yeah. Cop walks out of work. Ah, all dead. Everybody's dead. But that is the setting. We are now in the Demon City. Shinjuku. Part 1. The 9th of September, the year 2030, 5.05 in the afternoon. Ugh, I don't believe it. Oh, gross. Not again. The two high school students cried out in shrill dismay as they passed through the darkening school gate. The black wind had stealthily whirled up behind them, lifted up the skirts of their sailor uniforms, and even rudely slapped their asses. Perv! Stop! They stamped their feet in outrage, but the whirlwind, carrying a black school satchel, sprinted down the dusk-drenched hills towards Mejiro Station. In his wake, from all around, the two girls came the sounds of cheering and clapping. Good one! That's my man! The bystanders were guys from their school. The girls glared back at them, and then the evaporating trail left by the departing whirlwind. The cheeks of the offending parties reddened a bit, along with a pained expression that could even be interpreted as unrequited affection. Both girls whispered in their hearts, Izayo kun is an idiot! All he had to do was ask, and I'd show him. Twenty minutes later, the whirlwind, now clothed in the form of a regulation Prussian-style high school uniform, was gobbling down a king-sized serving of roasted pork ramen at a food stand behind Mejiro Station. He was flanked by a pair of similarly dressed teenagers. The whirlwind had long hair while they sported crew cuts. The larger of the two was the captain of Mina Kaze High School's kendo team, Kenji Shiratori. His smaller, nimbler companion was Tomoyasu Kayama, captain of the Shorinji Kenbo Club. Leaning against the counter next to Shiratori was a shinai, a bamboo fencing sword, in a tube-shaped duffel bag. 
The knuckles of Kayama's fists were thick with calluses. They'd arrived earlier and had been waiting for him. The other person there was a scowling old man who looked like a wizened philosopher, but he was only pro the proprietor of the food stand. The falling night crept down the alley. The only illumination came from the radioluminescent street lamps and the glow of the food stand lights. The moon was rising. So, what's up? asked the whirlwind as he slurped up the last of the broth and handed back the bowl. Due to a sudden change in the weather, his breath clouded brightly in the gloomy air. Kiyoya Izaoyoi was a student at Minakaze High School, a three-year comprehensive. Compared to the rough-hewn outlines of his two companions, he looked markedly more fit and trim, even handsome. Put on a pair of glasses and a textbook under his arm, and he could pass himself off as an honors student. Though thanks to the laid-back and likable vibe that surrounded him, the aura he gave off was anything but cool and contained. That bit of skirt-lifting notwithstanding, he was clearly something apart from the usual prodigy. Not a lot. Starting next month, things will get busy with extramural club competitions. Naturally, you're going to be in high demand. I want to make sure you put me and Kayama first on your list. There's bound to be people pulling the usual dirty tricks, like what Ika Akihabara Robot Technical High tried last time. Shiratoi had a soft voice that belied his large frame. Kiyoya grinned and nodded. Yeah, I never believed they'd sub in an android. Keeping up with robots is a real bear. They're getting just like real people. They got some of them trash-talking and pumping their fists on the podium. Yeah, don't matter how much you train, there's only so much you can do against the speed and power of a computer-controlled robot. Not to mention they keep getting better at making silicon look like real skin. They can make them sweat and bleed and pass through metal detectors and show up on x-rays like humans. Kayama picked up where Shiratori left off. The martial arts are on the ropes, I'm telling you. That's why we need you there. Yeah, we're talking about high school sports, but Minakaze High School's Kiyoya Izaoyoi is the only one who can take them on and knock their screws loose. It's up to you to preserve the dignity of the martial arts against those mechanized cheaters. How about another pork ramen? It's on Shiratori today. Don't mind if I do. One more and supersize it, Kiyoya ordered cheerfully. He thumped his two companions on the shoulders and flashed a leave-it-to-me smile, like he was a guy easy to game. Shiratori was about to protest, but Kayama caught his eye and grinned. Despite this give-and-take, Kyoya wasn't a formal member of any sports team. He stepped in when one of the regulars couldn't suit up or when they were facing off against a particularly tough opponent, an all-around pitch hitter. Since he didn't normally train with them and only appeared when the chips were down, he wouldn't be worth much unless he could really deliver which he'd done quite easily for the past three years. Minakaze High had been a second-ranked school until three years ago. At the preliminaries to the World Federal Martial Arts Junior Championships, they'd knocked out a veteran powerhouse. At the finals in Denmark, they'd turned the martial arts world on its head, racking up three victories in a row, largely thanks to him. So whenever a big match was coming up, all the teams started scheming to book him in advance. This time around, Shiratori and Kayama were the first in line. Considering his affinity for Kendo and Shorinji Kenpo, he probably would have shown up at their competition no matter what. But what was this business about knocking out robots? As Shiratori and Kayama tussled back and forth about who exactly was footing the bill, Kayoya turned his attention to the steaming pork ramen. He picked up his chopsticks and was about to dig in when... Hey! Shit! Shiratori's grunts and Kayama's shouts were overlaid with a harsh crunching sound. The air in the alley wavered. Kyoya pushed the two away from him to the right and left. He flipped backwards just as the black shadow sneaking up behind them crashed into the food stand. A vicious karate chop struck the edge of the counter and split it neatly in two. Broth and noodles scattered across the asphalt, along with pieces of the ramen bowls. The proprietor gaped and fell on his butt. What the hell? roared Shiratori, jumping to his feet and whipping out the shinai out of the duffel. In an instant, the sword flashed to the ready. Watch it, Izaoyoi, that guy's after you! Kayama stood with his feet, shoulders width apart. His right foot planted behind him his bald fists a bit further out in front of his chest than the customary opening stance, the posture he took in a real fight. He scanned the ground in front of him and saw no other attackers. Hello, Akatsuki, welcome. My brain hurts when thinking of this uh, anime version of this showing up as a Saturday morning cartoon in the sci-fi channel. <laughs> I did not realize there was an anime adaptation. I knew there was a movie and a live-action 
Not a, a TV show. Hmm. I'm going to have to check that out. Witnessing this act of superhuman power only ignited their fighting spirits. In the world of high school martial arts, they were both the best in their class. The two opponents facing them were giants with soft gray fedoras pulled over their eyes, wearing trench coats the same color, over six feet and weighing close to 250. Their expressionless, almost metallic, mask-like faces were weirdly off-putting, just as it was impossible to say whether they were oriental or occidental. A gust of wind blew down the alleyway, laden with murderous intent. Oh, knock it off, Kyoya drawled. The way the big man swung his arm like an axe right at Kyoya, it was clear to Shiratori and Kayama that Koyo Koya was the target. And yet he stood there as calm as a summer day. This ain't no joking matter, Shiratori bellowed, his gentle demeanor evaporating. No way we can just back down after a sunker punch like that. Move it! He spun around, ready to bust some balls, and gawked at the sight of Kyoya standing there, chopsticks and bowl in hand. Dodging danger by the skin of his teeth with inhuman quickness, he still managed to drain the last of the broth from the bowl without spilling a drop. Typical, said Shiratori, admiration in his voice. Kyoya polished off his second helping and sat down the bowl. These guys aren't human. They're cyborgs. Guess that means I'm the only one who can square off against them. The relaxed nature of this observation only raised the question of when he'd first realized it. He glanced down at the noodles and pork cutlets scattered on the ground, and his attitude changed abruptly. I was thinking of going for thirds, but I guess that's out of the question now. Damn it. Even his anger was short of true fury. His opponents didn't move. Shiratori and Kayama yelled together, Payback! The furious cry was followed by two bolts of lightning that shot at the two giants. Shiratori thrust at the throat of one. Kayama delivered a roundhouse kick to the head of the other. No matter who they were fighting, no matter how unreasonable the contest, these two wouldn't back down. The cyborgs didn't duck. The sensation of an aluminum bar hitting a brick wall reverberated through the boys' wrists as the giants blocked the blows single-handedly. Faster than they could retreat, all the strength drained from their bodies. Shiratori and Kayama collapsed on the spot. The thugs silently resumed their assault on Kyoya. They had tranquilizer guns in their palms. These were commando cyborgs. Kyoya got serious. Commando cyborgs were advanced fighting units reserved for military use alone. Equipped with tranquilizer guns, dimensional radar, particle beam weapons, tactical nukes, and electronic countermeasures, they could compete on an equal footing with mechanized units that included heavy tanks and fighter aircraft. There was no way they could deploy weapons like that in an urban back alley and escape the fallout. But they also had regenerative meta regenerative metabolisms, bioengineered muscles, and silicon frames several orders of magnitude harder than steel, all powered by 5,000 horsepower nuclear motors that could smash their way into Fort Knox. It'd be hard for them to call hand-to-hand -hand combat with flesh-and-blood human beings anything but a joke. Maybe it's a little late to bring this up, but what the hell is your game here? Is the military so hard up they're resorting to shaking down high school students? You cruising for a bruising with the cops? The cyborgs rushed him together, throwing punches that could perforate armor plating. Kyoya dove forward. The three figures converged into one. With a heavy clunk, the two cyborgs smashed together and rolled on the ground and didn't move. The only one getting to his feet was Kyoya. He was holding Shiratori Shinai in his right hand. When he'd leapt forward, he'd twisted his body and planted the tip of the Shinai against the chest of one, while delivering three straight-fisted jabs to the other. Except that no matter how well struck, there was no way he could have knocked out these cyborgs. That could be blasted with a bazooka at point range and still keep on ticking. Come out, come out, wherever you are, Kyoya barked at the entrance to the alley. He was already breathing normally. When the underlings screw up, the guy in charge has got to take responsibility. Three silhouettes appeared, lit from behind by the lights of the station beyond. A barrel-chested middle-aged man and two burly younger men that must be his bodyguards. They drew closer, revealing the startled looks on their faces. They were ordinary, human, Japanese. Wouldn't have believed it otherwise, the man muttered, glancing at the comatose cyborgs. Rai-sensei told me about you, but you've exceeded my expectations. He had a professional air about him. Nothing that suggested an enemy. 
Commando cyborgs are a cut above space and undersea workers. A lump of electronics. I didn't think any human could switch them off with his bare hands. You didn't kill them, I wonder. Relax. Give them an hour and they'll be back to normal. Though they might need an overhaul. More importantly, what about my friends in the ramen stand? Though his voice was as carefree as ever, Kyoya's eyes glittered like cut glass. The man nodded. Your friend should wake up in five minutes. The owner will be compensated. I apologize for the inconvenience. I'm sure the consolation money will cover any mental anguish. However, we will take their memories of the incident in exchange. He pointed at the entrance to the alley. A different set of men were standing guard, keeping any passerby from coming or looking in. The middle-aged man was obviously some sort of big shot. A car is waiting. One of the things my dad told me before he died was not to get into cars with strange old men. The man seemed to chuckle to himself. This does have something to do with him. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't introduced ourselves. He produced a black leather ID wallet and flipped it open. The golden badge glinted in the moonlight. Stamped into the metal was the image of a phoenix holding up the globe with flaming wings. Dai Yamashina, World Federation Government Information Bureau, Japan Section. A pleasure to meet you. Kyoya bristled. I don't care if you're the boss of the whole damned organization. I'm not going anywhere without a few answers first. Section Chief Yamashina nodded. The boss of the whole damned organization was, in fact, attacked by creatures or person unknown as in, and is in critical condition. We have three days to search out the sorcerer and undo the damage, specifically with your Nenpo. <laughs> Welcome, folks. Very cyberpunk kind of juvenile power fantasy murder cyborg, very Japanese. Yes, this is a lot of very typical Japanese uh, tropes thrown into a blender and made far darker, which I think to the modern eye is um, possibly less standout, but you have to think that 40 years ago, this was very, very new. This kind of thing, I feel like this was part of the roots of this very Japanese dark horror cyberpunk stuff that we have now with like Shin Megami Tensei and Devil Man and all that stuff. I am pretty sure this was written in 1980 or 19-something. He graduated. It doesn't say when he published it. Oh, 1982. All right. That night in Azabu, in a room at an ultra-modern headquarter of the Japan section of the World Federation Government Information Bureau, Section Chief Yamashina fill filled in Koya on the finer details of the situation. Since his father died, his aunt and uncle had been taking care of him. He was allowed to phone them and say that school club activities would be keeping him late. He was a favorite nephew, and they happily agreed. The situation concerned the attempted assassination of Kozumi Rama, president of the World Federation. Kozumi Rama. Every child above the age of three knew that name. Born a world apart from the earth, the man whom the great sage Agni Rai had declared at his birth was a holy man. The man who, until his 20th birthday, had never set foot on Earth. And yet, communicating with him telepathically across a quarter million miles of empty space, Master Rai conferred upon him a saint's education. At the age of 20, the savant was unanimously elected the representative of the lunar colony's governing body. At the young age of 35, he achieved the presidency of the World Federation. After that, in the span of six months, he'd oversee the signing of a peace treaty between those eternal enemies, the Arab League and the State of Israel, and concluded a comprehensive atomic, biological, and chemical weapons ban between the greater NATO and Asian alliances. These achievements were still fresh in everybody's mind. In particular, with nuclear war seeming inevitable, he summoned the leaders of the two parties to the New York Federation section, and in a meeting lasting only a few minutes, brought into existence the only possible conclusion. The summit later became known as the Five-Minute Miracle. Since 2010, the entire world had been gripped in a dark curse. In the face of economic recession, growing regional conflicts, and rising crime rates, President Rama was as resolute in his actions as he was charitable in his words, and he changed the world as a result. Five years after his inauguration, people began to sense that the trails he was blazing were indeed leading to a brighter future. And then several days before, on September 8, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, New York time, a literal hand of evil struck him down. The time difference meant it was recorded in Japan on the 9th at 3 in the morning. 
The incident took place in the presidential offices on the fifth floor of the Federation Government Office Building. Monitors recorded the particulars of what went on in there. Section Chief Yamashina played it back. The president was taking a break from pressing business, while his multi-purpose guard robot and secretary read through the cables and letters that had collected unread for several days. All correspondence was electronically scanned first. As busy as he was, the president couldn't read every message sent to him from around the world. It was simply a matter of expediency to trust such matters to the secretary's electronic brain. There was one other reason for this pre preliminary check. Ordinary letters and stationery, even the print itself, could be fashioned into explosives, poisonous gas, and other assassination tools. The criminal enterprises behind international drug smuggling syndicates and the merchants of death supplying the arms trade were the president's committed enemies. The president set aside the longer missives and asked to start with the cables. It happened during the fourth one. The android's memory bank contained the files and settings for 2,000s different languages. He stated that the letter was in ancient Sanskrit, the 4,000-year-old classical language that originated in India. It had been relayed via the Woodpecker communications satellite, but the originator was unknown. It later came to light that the satellite's router records that archived the originating sources of all relayed messages were blank for this particular one. The secretary noted that from the arrangement of the characters, the message appeared to be a kind of religious ritual. It could be read phonetically, but translation was impossible. The president indicated that he should read it. The android secretary began to read the cable, hardly possible to produce with human vocal cords, and that was when it appeared. A grotesque shadow separated itself from the president's shadow. It was no more substantial than a shadow, had no head or limbs, but crawling and wriggling along the floor was clearly a living thing. About six feet long, the end of the oval section that must have been its abdomen narrowed like a reptile's tail. Though it consisted of nothing more than that, the ghostly, unearthly aura rising from its entire length dropped the temperature in the room precipitously. The android secretary detected danger at once, rang the alarm in the adjoining guard room, and hit the creature with an electromagnetic baton. Undaunted, it rose up from the floor. Its body wavering back and forth, it approached the president. With every rippling movement, its body drew out thinner and thinner until it became a single line that appeared and disappeared, a two-dimensional being. Mucus-like material dripped from the edges, or so it seemed, as these two were shavings off a shadow. The miasma it ejected filled the room with a noxious odor. The discharge of a laser gun flashed from the android secretary's shoulder. The bright light was sucked into the pitch-black body. The guards came running, but the beams from their large-caliber particle guns couldn't penetrate the impossibly thin film of material. The secretary leapt into the fray. The shadow spun and wrapped around the hardened metal body with blazing speed. Before the president or the other guards could raise a cry, with a dull roar, the android's frame shattered into pieces and crumbled to the floor like a load of scrap iron. The shadow streaked at the president. An electromagnetic barrier flashed around his desk. The shadow cut through it with ease and attached itself to his waist. A wiry appendage grew from its tail, reached out, and seized the president's throat. One of the guards tried to tear it away but could find no purchase. The president's face grew dark and purple. Fighting for his life, he grabbed a paper knife, more like a short dagger, from the desk and plunged it into the shadow's appendage. The thin arm severed in the vicinity of the wrist. The shadow reared back, scattering dark sheets of its blood or plasma. It disappeared and reappeared two, three more times, then vanished. Clutching his throat, the president lifted the barrier. The guards rushed in, amazed. From the severed arm, the silhouette of a wrist remained fixed to the president, the writhing, snake-like fingers still clamped to his neck. The president was taken at once to a special ward in the hospital attached to the Federation building. A corps of doctors set working on him. They could do nothing. For lack of a better word, the wound, the shadow of the wrist, was all that remained of the hand buried a micromillimeter into the skin proved impervious to x-rays, CT scans, ultrasound, and other diagnostic measures. And yet, as the world's best physicians and their instruments looked on, the president continued to weaken. His breathing grew labored. An hour after the incident, just as it seemed all was lost, the president's teacher, 
Master Agni Rai suddenly appeared in the hospital room. This white-haired, turbaned old man, estimated to be a good 130 years old, had instructed the president for 20 years from sacred ground in India. He was a yogi, an esper, of incomparable power. Since the president moved to Earth, Master Rai was often seen in the president's company doubling as a bodyguard. Nowadays, his research into psychic powers and telekinesis continued, not only after the aforementioned criminal gangs, but others rode the waves of discord in the world, including religious cults springing up from the always fashionable worship of the devil. They plotted the assassination of the president and had no qualms about using paranormal techniques like remote manipulation. Unfortunately, the night before the incident, Master Rai had teleported to India to take part in an annual inter interstellar seance held on the peak of Amne Mashin in Tibet. He had appeared in the hospital after his supernatural senses detected a change in the president's condition. Seeing the president was on the verge of suffocating, the mark of the hand on his throat, Master Rai knew at once this was the work of black magic. While performing an incantation to stay the accursed wizardry at work, he said, before departing for India, I erected a psychic wall around him that should have repelled the strongest curse or spiritual attack. Why was this apparition able to break through? At length, the gray-faced vice president described what had happened. After viewing the video recording of the incident, the old sage nodded with a severe expression. He stated a demon realm monster called a Nidom had attacked the president. Aw, thank you, Daniel. When the android secretary began reading the ancient script, the conjuration shattered my shields and called forth the Nidom. The sender went to the trouble of relaying the message through a communications satellite as a diplomatic cable, knowing that its effectiveness depended on it being read to the recipient. It is a good thing I left a holy dagger for his self-defense. I will understand better once we determine why the president had his secretary read the cable in the first place, how it was able to reach him precisely on the day I would not be there. I cannot believe the timing was coincidental. Whoever called forth that monster must have read my movements. After a moment of quiet contemplation, the master met with the vice president and the Federation High Council in another room and explained the situation to them in terms that left them all pale. Unfathomable dangers are assaulting the planet as we speak. Should the president die, the world, well on its way to its most promising future since recorded history began, will slip back into another dark age ruled by war, doubt, and suspicion. If, if things are left to fester in their current state, the curse will kill the president. Even with all the power at my command, I cannot hold it back for long. If the warlock who commands this black magic or the hex itself is not destroyed in three days by one o'clock in the afternoon on September 12th, the president will lose his life. The council members erupted in consternation, and all the more so those who, like the president, knew the extent of the old man's considerable and inexplicable powers. They couldn't help but recognize the gravity of a world ruled by evil sorcery should the president die. As the room descended into panic, the master said, in a kind but stern voice, the World Federation and the intelligence apparatuses of all the affiliated Federation states should exert every effort to locate the Egyptian shaman Rebe Ra, and if they do ascertain his location, make no attempt to detain him. He employs demons as his guards that no conventional weapons can harm. I would go, but unless I attend to the seals and the incantations strengthening them, I fear the president will succumb. I will say this once again. My powers will last only to the 20th, uh, to the 12th at 1 o'clock. Best you hurry. Having seen the video recorded of the assault, the council members were uniformly persuaded by the master's remarks. They jumped to their feet and rushed out of the room. The vice president remained behind when the master called to him. There is somebody else I wish for you to find, he whispered. For the time being, I wish to keep this from the president's political opponents. But there is one other person who possesses the skills I have taught him. What a start, huh? This is, uh, yes, this is a very amazing blend of fantasy, sci-fi, monsters, uh, Hindu yogis, like, there's so much going on here. There's so much that he's blended very well. I mean, Matt, the world building and stuff that he has put into, like, four pages, like, we're, like, right here, and he's built this very fascinating world. He just drops the bomb of, yes, the president went to school on the moon, and he was taught by a psychic yogi from planet Earth. <laughs> just drops that.
I will be right back. I'm gonna refill my water and we will continue. Kikuchi has a talent for just dropping uh, very interesting world building moments just out of the blue somewhere in very uh, uh, matter of fact ways that make it come across as almost more uh, suited to the setting like oh yeah well that's just how this world is even though it seems so wild to us <laughs> kill the president come on his name is Rama if he's named Rama he's got to be the hero right we we talked about the story of Rama. <laughs> and that's me, said Kyoya. He was sitting on the sofa, slurping the last of a glass of orange juice through a straw. Section Chief Yamashina's explanation and the video of the attack on the president had just ended, but he asked the question as if he and they were entirely unrelated. To be precise, your father, Jenichiro. Three decades ago, he was taught the mysteries of yoga at the feet of Master Rai. Huh. News to me. Not bad for a hard old nut like him. Unfortunately, he died of pneumonia four years ago. The section chief nodded. That is why we are turning to you. According to our investigation, a month after you were born, your father took you to Mount Daisetsu on the island of Hokkaido. It seems he and your mother had divorced. He must have been fully committed to the course he was taking. Mount Daisetsu is one of Japan's 13 holiest sites, a place to sharpen the will and the mind. There your father trained you in the martial art of Nenpo. I can hardly begin to imagine such skills practiced from the time you were a child, but they must be terrific. The section chief retrieved a fax from the machine on his desk. A report from the maintenance division. The cyborgs have regained consciousness, but their internal circuitry was altered such that they had to be sent for repairs. No damage at all to the external structure, and no apparent damage to the nervous system. The cause is uncertain. The maintenance division techs are beside themselves. The master asked that your skills be tested, but the results proved more amazing than expected. A cryptic smile rose to Koya's lips. Whatever. Why did you drag me all the way down here? Section Chief Yamashina sat down on the couch in front of Kyoya. He looked at him in the eye and said in a heavy voice, We want you to capture the sorcerer and bring him here. We pin down his location. The rest is up to you. On the 12th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the 13th at 3 in the morning, Japan time. That gives us three more days. Are you willing to deploy your Nenpo techniques for the good of the world? Give me a break, Kyoya looked away. I'm a high school senior, for crying out loud. I was minding my own business, enjoying some ramen, and those two Neanderthals pick a fight with me. I won, so that means I've got to save the world? What, I'm supposed to say, sure thing. We've got cops and armies for that sort of stuff. I can't believe grown men have been running around after a juvenile delinquent like me, idiots. The section chief sighed. I'm afraid the reality is rather embarrassing. The fact is, as soon as we isolated the target, the main office counseled the master to deploy Esper agents. I shouldn't have to tell you he, v he vetoed the idea. He illustrated why in a particularly vivid manner. He had three battle espers and military cyborgs sent to the president's hospital room. In front of the Federation High Council, he told them to attack him in any way they could. The federal military commander gave the okay. So what happened, said Kyoya, intrigued. Nothing. The espers and their telekinesis, the cyborgs and their particle guns, none of their weapons made a dent. The master, though, with no more than a flick of the finger, rendered them all unconscious, knocked over like ten pins. Then he declared that their enemy possessed even more power than that. The powers of the demon realm are beholden, not beholden to the physical laws of the world. Physical attacks are pointless. I see. So it comes down to Nenpo. I don't really know how, but with sufficient training, human thought can elevate ordinary physical energy to spiritual power and perform what are commonly called miracles. Nenpo transforms that ability into a martial art that can destroy sorcery and the demons it summons. I'm only repeating what the master said. You will be compensated in any case, but the clock is ticking even as we sit here. So the question still stands. Will you help us? He bowed his head. 
Kyoya flashed a thin smile. This wasn't an act. His was a request from the heart, a matter of the utmost urgency. No thanks, said Kyoya. Anyway, I look at it. It ain't a sword I want to pull out of the stone. It's up to more responsible people than me to save the world. Besides, there's no guarantee I've got what it takes to grab this big bad sorcerer. Can somebody here resurrect me if it turns the tables? Yamashina didn't answer. Sorry. It's not like I'm wanting to screw with you on purpose, but I gotta speak my mind. I hope you don't think any worse of me for it. First of all, I'm generally up to no good, or I'm simply not trying. I've given the Nenpo business short shrift. I'd rather party hardy and hit on girls, not spend all day at the dojo. You know the advice my dad left in his will? Live free. What the hell, you know? I wasn't exactly the apple of his eye. I do not happen to think so, said a calm, low voice behind him. Shit! Kyoya jumped even more than Section Chief Yamashina. Up to that very moment, he hadn't detected any other presence in the room. The owner of the voice had appeared in the room at an instant. He whirled around. A small old man clothed in white stood there. He was wearing a turban that looked like a squashed vase. Only his face, framed by the high collar of his jacket, was dark, as if tanned by the sun and wrinkled. His white beard reached his chest, further suggesting an advanced age. Even so, his eyes were as clear as a baby's, and his frame radiated a vigor that pushed Kyoya back like a gust of wind. Master Rai! Yamashina jumped up from the couch and ran over to him. W when did you arrive? I would have arranged a welcome if only you'd let me know. Please, this way. The otherwise straight-laced section chief smothered the small man, who stood no higher than his chest, with unctuous courtesies, enough to make Kyoya want to gag. Enough already. Leave the geezer alone. Don't matter if he's standing or sitting. There's no way he'd leave the president alone for this long anyway. Kyoya's right hand twitched. The straw flew through the air, pierced the master's face, and thudded into the wall. It's a doppelganger. The real thing is in New York as we speak. A doppelganger was an alter ego that could surmount time and space, recreating a copy of the self anywhere and any time of a person's choosing. Only those deeply immersed in the secret mysteries of yoga could ever hope to achieve such a feat. The old man's smile crinkled the corner of his eyes. You're a discerning young man. What would I, I would expect from the son of Genichiro Izayoi? It seems all your practice has amounted to something after all. <sighs> yeah, right. We just went through all this. I know, the master said, sitting down on the couch, shushing Kyoya with a nod. You are still an ex inexperienced practitioner of Nenpo, but that is not all I know. I know your character and qualities. With Kyoya Izayoi, the son has outdone the parent. So much so, I would like to take you on as a pupil. Genichiro understood that as well, and so trained you from the time you were in diapers. Kyoya grimaced. You know what? Sometimes flattery won't get you anywhere. I've got no opinion about how great and wonderful my dad supposedly was. Anyway, I really don't think this is one of those like-father-like-son things. He got up from the sofa and waved his hand. I'm leaving, if you don't mind. Thanks for the drinks. Wait. <sighs> Fine. With one word from the master, Kyoya returned to the sofa. He didn't feel compelled in the least, more like being gently turned at the shoulders. Genichiro apparently didn't explain his reasons for developing his Nenpo techniques. Not in the slightest, Kyoya shook his head. The memories of the harsh training on Mount Daisetsu came alive in his thoughts. The purification rituals, concentrating the mind under a pounding waterfall, kneeling under a freezing night sky in Zen meditation in order to become one with the spiritual energy of the universe, training with his fists and the sword until his body throbbed and he coughed up blood. Why his father went to such lengths, why he drove him so hard. As far back as he could remember, his father refused to respond to any questions or doubts. One of the reasons Kyoya eventually rebelled. Your father and the sorcerer, Rebi Ra, the mastermind behind this latest incident, were both my disciples. They both trained under me. The master's quiet voice yanked Kyoya back to reality, and back to the reality of what he'd said. What the hell? What did you just say? This was obviously news to Section Chief Yamashina as well. Thirty-seven years ago, two young men came to Tibet, to my hermitage in the mountains, to pursue their studies of yoga's mysterious powers. They were both twenty-five at the time. Despite their quite different nationalities, Japanese and Egyptian, they both possessed the burning desire and qualities necessary to conquer the heights of spiritual power. With this in mind, I took them on as disciples. 
As expected, they progressed in an amazing rate. What had taken me a decade in my younger years, they mastered in three. At that pace, they would surely achieve the desired oneness with the cosmic mind, at the extreme boundaries of the yoga art. But two years after that, the two left the mountain. A touch of bitterness colored the master's voice. Beneath the backdrop of this incident was a buried, dark history. Kyoya and Yamashina leaned forward and listened with rapt attention. Oh, oh, mm. Yeah, uh, I hope you all have your uh, anime and, and fiction bingo cards out, because we're hitting a lot of them. I think he does a good job of molding them all into something new and interesting, but he's definitely just taken this and taken that. I mean, this right now, the two masters that uh, become rivals under the same teacher, say a very, very uh, martial arts movie, isn't it? Because Rebi Ra had tasted the raptures of the demon realm, an undiscovered country at the borders of this one, where the wicked lie in wait to corrupt the virtuous and add them to their growing number, promising to turn loathing and hatred to joy and fashion reason out of fear and hopelessness. How many capable acolytes I have seen fall into their poisonous grasp. They should have shrugged them off and steeled their wills to reach higher states of self-enlightenment. Treat those temptations as the phase of their training to be risen above, just as Buddha was tempted beneath the banyan tree and Christ was tested by the devil in the wilderness. The master sadly shook his head. But Ra succumbed. While tempering his body, his spirit chose the pleasures of the demon realm over the joys of the spirit. One day he abruptly departed. As a disciple of the demon realm, he could not enjoy even a single day of peace or calm, and he left to make use of the skills he'd acquired thus far. I should not have let him return to the ordinary world. At the time, I could not imagine he had fallen as far as it turns out he had. For a while, I heard rumors of a warlock who possessed powers unheard of in times past or present, and regretted my decision. And then this incident. I take the blame for what has happened. Defeating Ra is my responsibility, but I cannot move. So it falls to the one person who equals him in strength and ability, the son to whom Genichiro taught everything he knew. That son broke the air of tension in the room with rolled eyes and a shrug. His father's past meant nothing to him. And even if it did and he agreed, it was hard to say what he could accomplish with that kind of attitude. Yamashina breathed a dejected sigh. I get it about the bad guy, but why did my father leave? A faraway look came to the master's eyes. Two days after Ra left the mountain, Genichiro followed him. It seemed he had an idea about what Ra was up to, and he was only the only one who could stop him. Perhaps he even knew a day like today was coming, and that his son would be the one facing off against him. Otherwise, he would have trained himself and engaged the battle. Genichiro possessed powers of precognition that neither Ra nor I possessed. During our telepathic interactions, he foresaw the future with a certainty I could not match. Even Ra was impressed on more than one occasion. I don't want to hear it, Kyoya said, his voice rising to a shout. You think you're going to pull the wool over my eyes, spilling yarn like that? You think I'm going to do a 180 on my life based on a bunch of conjecture? So tell me why my dad didn't say squat about why he was putting me through all that training. If he'd been straight up with me, you know, I, I might have gone along for the ride. And if he did have some sort of reason, then what's with this live free crap? Kyoya folded his arms across his chest and turned away with a huff. This sucks. None of this was my idea, remember? If I say I ain't going, then I ain't going. Hey, she's cute. Startled by the sudden commotion, the section chief cast a surprised glance at the door behind him. The door leading to the adjacent room closed, and standing next to it was a young woman. She possessed a translucent kind of beauty. Her glimmering black hair reached her waist, accentuating the striking clarity of her skin. Her light blue two-piece dress was plainly tailor-made, and simply by being worn by her seemed to glow of its own accord. She bowed silently and with elegant steps crossed the room and sat down next to the master. This is the president's daughter, Sayaka-san. I will formally introduce you later, the master asked in an affectionate voice. Have you heard our conversation thus far? The girl, Sayaka Rama, nodded. She was 16, a freshman at a high school in New York. Knowing there was someone in Japan who could help, she'd come directly here with no idea whether he would listen to her or not. The master had told her everything in New York. 
The section chief had left her in the guest suite, not wanting to burden her should his negotiations with Kyoya fail. Out of concern for her father's welfare, Sayaka had snuck into the adjoining room and listened through the door. You're our only hope, Sayaka said earnestly. Kyoya just stared back at her. There was none of the lecher in his gaze, such was the young woman's refined character. Not counting the ones at his own school, this martial arts maven would need the fingers of both hands to count the girlfriends he'd been stringing along, but he'd never reacted like this before, no matter how beautiful the woman in his sights. Please, save my father. Right now he is fighting for his life in a hospital bed far away. He is all I have right now. Sayaka's mother had died shortly after her birth. The reason alone explained her deep and abiding love for him. Kyoya felt a gentle sensation in his chest. Some old man wasn't asking for help on behalf of world peace and the like. It was a daughter on behalf of her beloved father. He took note of his softening heart and deliberately put on a bad attitude. Sure. On one condition. Lend an ear. She did as requested. Sayaka's face suddenly flushed bright red. Ugh, said the section chief. But faster than he could interfere, the sound of a lively slap echoed around the room. Ow! Kyoya pressed his hand against his cheek with an exaggerated frown. Sayaka examined her own palm with an equally surprised expression. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done such a thing. Ah, forget it. My face is just as happy getting slapped by a babe. Kyoya shot her a wink. No harm, no foul. He could tell she wasn't sorry just because she'd hauled off and smacked the man who could save her father. It was an honest response. She wasn't trying to play him. So, will you help me? Nah, this is one thing and that's another. So, you're, uh, you are angry then, she said, the forlorn look on her face, that of a young woman lost in the depths of despair. Kyoya hastily added, no, uh, to cut to the chase here, you are our only hope, said the master, repeating the same words as Sayaka, albeit in more severe tones. For Sayaka-san's father, for the planet, this is not something I could say to any other person. The way I see things developing, Ra's goal is more than a brief spree of chaos. He seeks ruin on a much grander, deeper scale. Put bluntly, to destroy the soul of the world. The section chief furrowed his brow. What the hell does that mean? The demon lodged in the president's throat. The handprint of the Nidom assassin uh, summoned forth from the demon realm. Using chiromancy techniques, I traced back Ra's intentions and designs. In one way or another, it seems he is attempting to call forth from the depths of creation an evil of unmatched dimensions. Kyoya's eyes glittered. Yamashina stammered, y You mean Satan? I do not know if he will go that far, but should this being appear but once, the world would be steeped in fear and despair. The darkness of the damned would reign instead. Men would be bound together only by hate and murder in a twilight struggle for life. Love and hope and joy lost. Civilization as we know it would rot away. This would become another demon realm. For a long moment, silence filled the room. Then Kyoya said nonchalantly, I see. He's supposed to be a ritual s He cut off the rest of the sentence. In a faint voice, Sayaka finished it for him. A ritual sacrifice. The master looked at her, compassion showing in his eyes. Yes. Having paid the necessary tribute in the form of a man of such high virtue, it will appear when the president draws his last breath. Ra's previous efforts failed because the offering was lacking. You're telling me this bastard has tried this before? Yes, and we are now at the scene of the crime. Where? When? The master said softly, early in the 21st century in Japan. Kyoya searched his memories, then bolted from the sofa. Son of a bitch! That's where you're gonna send me? You're nothing but a pair of double-dealing con men! Nobody is forcing you to do anything. What is your answer? Hmm. <laughs> Kyoya answered, again huffed and, and turned away. This sinks to high heaven, but let me get this straight. In that case, the earthquake was because of it showing up. But this raw chap couldn't seal the deal? The master nodded. As Ra summoned it from deep within the earth, the streams of demonic energy failed to converge and were redirected instead into the earth's crust and caused the damage we still see today, all in complete contradiction to the known laws of science. Kyoya found himself at a loss for words. Section Chief Yamashina and Sayaka were also rendered speechless, their faces wane. That earthquake. I must return shortly, said the master's doppelganger. I cannot easily perform the incantations for the president and converse with you at the same time. If nothing else, please remember this. 
Kyoya Izayoi, the peace of the world rests upon your shoulders, the future and soul of the world. Won't you yield and accept this duty? The master's form faded. Before disappearing entirely, his low but demanding voice said, A true hero cannot overlook the suffering of others. My disciple was a true hero. I believe the same of his son. Caught in the steady gaze of the young woman and the middle-aged man, Kyoya Izayoi averted his eyes. Mm -hmm. So that's how it all ties back into the very beginning of the story. The earthquake that destroyed Shinjuku was an attempted demon summoning of it. It. <laughs> He's summoning because he figures the resulting world is better than the kind set where a president is raised on the moon by a yogi. Listen, <laughs> sounds like he wasn't doing that bad. That is still very funny to me. So, all that world building basically has told us the world is actually pretty much at peace right now, except for that horrible little don't don't look at Shinjuku and how bad that is. But everything else is pretty chill, uh, except now the president's dying, and if he dies, he's going to be used to sacrifice and create an, a horrible demon world for everyone, and everywhere will be like Shinjuku. So now we're going to start getting into what is Shinjuku like now as he uh, makes his decision to enter into it and try and change things. Part 2 The darkness was omnipresent and oppressive, like an expanding slick of heavy black oil. In its very center, the smothering silence suddenly broke. Kaki, you there? asked an inorganic voice, utterly devoid of human emotion. Oh, sorry. A point of light glowed in the empty space. No brighter than a cigarette lighter, it steadily expanded in height and width, sprouted arms and legs until it took on human dimensions, and yet did not disturb the density of the darkness in the slightest, a fire that shared its light with nothing, the fire of the demon realm. You're here, said the same voice. Doki and Suiki should be arriving soon. He meant the demons of earth and water. Don't let your powers slacken, the enemy draws near. The fire wavered. The portion forming its face bent into a sneer, a sprite that manipulated the fires of this world. That was Kaki. A burning right hand stretched out toward the speaker, collided with something, and deflected. The column of flame bursting apart like an overripe tomato. The streamers curling around and headed at the target. Stop it, the voice barked. The lines of fire reversed course and merged into one and became an arm again. At the same time, the lights came on. The speaker had switched on a miniature nuclear lamp. The strange, concrete-enclosed space emerged in the blue-white radioactive glow. An old desk and chair in the center. A laboratory bench lined with rows of beakers and test tubes. Bookshelves filled with worn, leather-bound books of spells and magic. And far on the other side, an incongruous collection of electrical machinery and what appeared to be automated surgical equipment. Considering its size and the height of the vaulted ceiling, what looked at first like an ordinary room could be more appropriately described as a large underground plaza. This was one room in the secret headquarters of the sorcerer Rebi Ra and his three demon realm bodyguards. The evil odors bustling out of the noxious fumes in the test tubes and beakers mingled with the ghostly aura emitted by the inhabitants of the room, together with the cool air, a combination no normal human could stand for more than a minute. This was a small demon realm within the human world. I know the strengths of your powers, scolded the sorcerer. He was seated at the desk wearing a black hood and mantle. Thirty-seven years before, when he was twenty-five, he had been Master Rai's pupil. That made him sixty-two. The thin face inside the shroud looked ten years older, except that his eyes possessed a haunting glow, and the aura cast off by his body lent him an oily demeanor. He held up his palm for Kaki to see. Gray smoke rose from the scorched flesh where he'd blocked Kaki's arm of flame. Otherwise, the flame would have engulfed his body and burned him down to the marrow of his bones. Despite calling them forth as their master, these creatures of the demon realm must be treated with all due discretion, though there wasn't the slightest indication of pain on the sorcerer's face. But the enemy we face next is far stronger. My prophetic dreams are stained black and blue, hopefully not with your blood. And the name of this enemy, another presence asked, is that Suki? 
Doki is here also. The voice came from the silver goblet sitting near the sorcerer's hand that still held a few drops of wine. Show yourself. Yes. The upper half of a human body rose out of the goblet. It wore a hood and medieval priestly garb, the same color as the sorcerer's. Its entire body, at least the upper half that appeared from the goblet, dripped with water. This sprite had water at its command. Shadowed by the hood, its features were impossible to make out, except for the lively red gleam of its eyes. A mist filled the room as the auras of Kaki and Suki collided. Whoa! Even knowing this was a regular occurrence, Suiki's unexpected appearance caused the sorcerer to push back his chair and then look down at his feet. Something resembling a man's head and shoulders pushed out of the tiled floor, resembled because its face lacked eyes or a nose. The fingers seemed to adhere to its hands more out of obligation than biology, and its skin was the reddish-brown color and grain of the soil far below. Whether concrete or stone, nothing that touched the ground could hold him back, for this was Doki, the devilish earth sprite. The enemies of the earth were gathered here amidst the haze and devilish miasma. And the name? asked Doki. I do not know the name or the appearance, but I can make an educated guess. After I caught the vision of the demon realm and cast aside my sacred training, I heard that the man I had studied with also descended the mountain and perfected a martial arts called Nenpo. Based on his disposition, I would say that he did so in order to challenge me. He did not pursue me at the time, so I set such concerns aside. His name is Genichiro Izayoi. The murderous discord of the three sprites whirled around the room. So what became of him? I do not know. Thirty years have passed. He would be an old man by now. Perhaps a son or disciple. Either way, the foe I see in my dreams has frightening skills at his command. Your own powers may not be enough to defeat him. With a dull roar, Kaki's body expanded to twice its size, an expression of his rage. The heat shook the air in the room. A fierce burst of steam rose from Suki's upper half. Doki alone appeared to laugh silently. Kaki said, Leave him to me. I don't care how strong he thinks he is. If he lives according to the laws of the mortal world, he can die according to them as well. He will not lay a finger on us. Give me a good ten seconds and watch me take him apart piece by piece, molecule by molecule, atom by atom. The sorcerer gave Kaki's overweening confidence an equally self-satisfied nod. He had a great amount of trust in the strength of his supernatural bodyguards. I'm counting on you. The day is approaching when we will meet face to face. Reveal your true powers slowly when the time comes. What about tonight's rite? Is the offering ready? A minimum of two virgins is necessary. Yes, said Suiki. One was located last month and a letter sent. All is going according to plan. The other is being sought out as we speak. She will surely be delivered to the altar of blood at the appointed time. Then you had better be on your way. Taking, <clears throat> taking that as their cue, the demons disappeared. For a little while longer, their nuclear lamp illuminated the sorcerer's smiling face in the electric glow. But then that, too, died away, inviting the return of the surrounding black. Man, I really want to keep reading this, but I think my voice is giving out. We may have to call it there. <clears throat> I really love this book so much. It's so good. I love all his works. I'm really deeply invested in his specific brand of weirdness. Um, so I, I hope that uh, we will continue to read some of these in the future and get through these. I'm going to add a, uh, two stories to our, our general schedule. I'm changing things up a little. going to experiment with another schedule based on how I'm feeling with my new meds and stuff. Uh, see how it works this week, and then we'll reevaluate it. I will start having two streams a day at... 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. because uh, I'm a very much an early bird. I have to wake up very early to take specific medications, so I'm up at like 4 or 5 anyway, and uh, that'll give people in other time zones a chance to tune in. So 7 a.m., we'll have our morning readings, read some books. Uh, if you can't be awake then, I apologize, but maybe if you're going to work in the car, if you're something, you know, if you're in the my time zone and you can chill in in the morning, feel free. Uh, otherwise, it'll always be up afterward. And then games and stuff will be at 2 p.m. in the normal normal time. And then I think maybe Friday afternoons we'll do watches and stuff. Well, we'll probably do watches whenever we feel like it, you know. Uh, 
cool new shows coming out I'm very excited about. So yeah, that's uh, everything, I think. Uh, we're going to take a break on Persona 5 Royal for a little bit of Katsuki. I'm sorry. I'm just, I want to play something else. I want to play horror again. I miss being scared. So we'll, we'll take a little break, but just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, finish Silent Hill Homecoming and then probably so much. Someone paid me for that and then I couldn't get it to work and now it's working and I need to get back to it. So um, thanks for listening. The other story we're going to start reading, uh, maybe this will be a, a, a apology to Akatsuki. We're going to start reading the book that inspired Shin Megami Tensei. It's called Digital Devil Story. The first two books are translated by fans. The third one is not. So I've not read those. Warning. So we'll be going into those kind of blindly, but I really would like to read them, so we will read them together. So those are the two new editions. Uh, 7 a.m. reading, the other three will be the web novels we've already started, and then these two horror stories, and then in the afternoon we'll just do general games and watches and stuff. Uh, see how that goes for a little while, see if that works. I need a bookmark. Anyway, other news, um, I've added Kofi to my, um, I already had a Kofi, but I've changed it up. The storefront for my books is now on Kofi because of just general, it's easier. They let you download things right directly. It's really great. So if you want to buy my books and stuff, go to Kofi. Um, I'm going to test out, they have like a Patreon kind of thing that might be useful for, because they make it really easy to download material and content. We'll see about maybe doing that uh, instead of pa Patreon. Well, not instead of, because lots of folks are over there, but as an alternative to, we will see. Um, but in the meanwhile, you can click the link, donate there if you'd like, and then now there's a little widget that'll say when people have donated it coffee, so that's fun. Anyway, thanks again, and thanks to all of our members so much for the support and patience lately. Oh, uh, there's a bloody OBA for Digital Devil. Nice. We do, we also, as we're reading through his books, we need to watch those movies. I have not seen the De Demon City one. Um, I've seen a couple of his, but not all of them, but we'll get to that. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Bye.